do you really need to know to start a ketogenic diet? There's a lot of information out there. And if you're just getting to know about a ketogenic diet, I know it could be overwhelming. So many different yeah. voices out there. The keto repeatos are often spreading misleading, erroneous, and sometimes just straight up false information. So I kind of see my job here is to clear the air and make it as simple and straightforward as possible. So what do you really need to know to start a ketogenic diet? Number one is the macros. There's three macronutrients. There are nutrients available in abundance in all foods. They are protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Now, carbohydrate and fat are both energy sources. Our body stores one of these in great abundance, and that's fat. A lot of us are doing a ketogenic diet because our body has gone through such a long phase of storing this macronutrient in such abundance that we're ready to tap into it. But metabolically, it can be a little bit difficult when we're inputting lots of glucose and foods that are highly palatable, both high in carbs and fat, and low in protein. This could make it really difficult to tap into those body fat stores and burn the stored nutrients that our body is so intelligently designed to pack on in times of abundance. Carbohydrate is a nutrient that is non-essential your body can actually make glucose from the backbone of fatty acids and from certain amino acids as well. And protein is an essential nutrient that your body is unable to synthesize at all. Protein, fat, and carbs. Protein and carbs are both four calories per gram. Fat is nine calories per gram. Much more energetic bang for your buck per gram of fat. Now, on a ketogenic diet, carbohydrates will be very restricted. You're going to want to keep your carbs at a maximum of like 20 to 30 grams net carbohydrate. And those carbs are not going to be coming from sugar. They're not going to be coming from high glycemic foods. Even healthy glucose sources like honey, and fruit, stuff like that, you're not going to be eating on a ketogenic diet. Those carbs are going to be coming from low glycemic vegetables, stuff like avocados, which is a fruit, uh, spinach, Fibrous, non-glycemic veggies will make up those carbs. Keep those carbs low, 20 to 30 net carbs maximum, and don't go thinking you can have a few bites of rice or starches or sugars. Keep those to a minimum, clean your cupboard out of the foods that are not gonna fit onto your diet, and you're gonna do well. Now, the next pro uh, macro that we're gonna look at is protein. Of course, no matter who's doing keto, you're going to want to keep those carbs low. Some athletes can do more carbohydrates. I suggest when you're first adapting to a ketogenic diet, don't go too high on the carbohydrates. Don't mess with the carbohydrates levels too much. You can play around with a little higher carb or targeted carbohydrate intake later. But keep it strict and low on those carbs. Protein's the next macro. Protein. I recommend staying between about 1.5 up to 2.2 grams per kilogram of your lean body mass in protein. Now protein, you may have been told, is something to avoid on keto. You may have even been tricked into being afraid of protein. Gluconeogenesis, gonna get ya. In fact, gluconeogenesis, which is just the generation of glucose from protein or the backbone of fatty acids, remember, you can make it out of protein and fat. People aren't telling you, don't eat fat because you're going to turn it into glucose. But a lot of people are stoking fear about protein. In fact, protein is the most important macro for everybody to eat on a ketogenic diet. Most people on the standard American diet, on the standard Western diet, are vastly under eating whole foods based protein sources. And the protein they are eating is like pea protein powder and whey protein powder. All these bodybuilder bro foods. Whey protein powder being the leftover material after you make cheese has been conveniently marketed to you as a viable source. You want the protein to come from whole nutrient dense foods, animal based foods. You might have been told that animal fats are bad for you, that saturated fat is bad for you. Well your body stores this saturated fat in abundance. And digging a little bit deeper into ancestral nutrition, as you might find in the book of Weston A. Price's uh, uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, every single his uh, culture in the history of mankind has maintained close, intimate contact with animal-based protein and fat sources. So that protein is going to be coming from animals. 
from eggs and from nutrient dense whole foods sources, not powders, not shrink wrapped powdered protein products. So protein, we have minimum requirements of this macronutrient. Many people under eat it on a standard American diet. Many people are deprived of specific amino acids that we require. I'm not saying to overeat protein. A lot of the people who are fear mongering about protein won't even define what too much protein is, even though they say that if you eat too much of it, it's going to be bad for you. Now, protein can be turned into glucose, but this has been shown through many experiments to be done on an as needed basis, not just because your body turns extra protein into glucose. Insulin glucagon ratio, very, very important. important. I uh, suggest you look at Benjamin Bickman's lecture on YouTube concerning the insulin glucagon ratio. When you're on a high carbohydrate diet, the insulin release from protein is much more. Whereas if you're on a low carbohydrate diet, the insulin release from protein is much less and you raise glucagon levels, which will help you to generate ketones in the liver, which basically means energy from fat that you're going to be burning. So protein levels, again, 1.5 up to like 2.2 grams per kilogram, depending on your activity levels, your level of lean muscle mass, your preference for protein. Also, as we get older, as we age, we require more protein than we ate when we were younger because we're not as good and efficient at maintaining our lean body mass and at using those amino acids. So protein, you've got minimum requirements. You go too much under that, you're going to get problems. Never go under 1.2 grams per kilogram of your lean body mass, or you will go catabolic. So get your minimum amounts of protein in. That's going to bring satiety. That's going to make it so you're just not so hungry. And that protein's always going to come with healthy fat, which is the next macro that we're going to talk about. Fat being the energy source on a ketogenic diet, your body's going to break down fat in the liver, turn that into ketones, which you will burn for energy in the brain and in many organs like the heart, which one run very efficiently off ketones. And after you become well adapted to a ketogenic diet, your body is going to be used to, in this ketotic state, actually oxidizing fatty acids directly in the muscle tissues. So a lot of people get duped into measuring their blood ketones obsessively and thinking that the higher blood ketones they get when they first start keto is going to give them magical powers. The midichlorians in your blood are somehow improving your metabolic health. Whereas if you're on a glucose-based diet, nobody's looking at high blood glucose as a marker of metabolic efficiency. Right? Your body's going to maintain a narrow bandwidth of any energy source in the blood. Super high ketones doesn't mean you're burning more body fat. Remember that. You can elevate your ketones through eating a bunch of MCT oil, which will metabolize into ketones directly in the liver very rapidly, but that doesn't mean you're burning more body fat. It just means you got high ketones. Now, the next thing you got to be concerned about is the electrolytes. Three electrolytes. Now, fat intake doesn't need to be elevated astronomical levels in order to achieve ketosis. In fact, just restriction of carbohydrates is enough to achieve a ketotic state. When you are restricting carbohydrates, your body will be breaking down fats either from the diet or from the body to burn that for fuel. If you're trying to burn body fat, you don't want to be elevating your dietary fats to astronomical levels. But in the beginning, you don't want to restrict your fats too much. I usually recommend about one gram up to 1.5 if you're not getting the satiety yet. 1, 1 to 1 1.5 grams of fat per gram of protein that you're intaking, which of course was based on your lean body mass. And that fat will be adjusted once your satiety drops. So if you're trying to lose body fat, once your satiety hits, you can drop back the fats and peel that back to one gram of fat per gram of protein or even less as long as you're not stressing out the system through creating this huge caloric deficit and you're going to be able to burn body fat efficiently and effectively for a long time. Many people end up being able to do this without even having to track their macros all the time. They end up naturally restricting their food intake because they're getting sufficient protein and they're adapted to ketosis. Now in the beginning, keto flu symptoms can include muscle cramps, muscle twitching, inability to sleep, even digestive issues. Now, lack of electrolytes is a major issue when you're first starting out keto because when you're low in insulin, your kidneys will excrete sodium. You want to make sure to increase your salt intake. There are three electrolytes that we want to be concerned with. Sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Salt, easy. 
Take at least a teaspoon of salt with each meal if you're doing three meals a day. Get a minimum of five to 7,000 milligrams of salt in your diet each day. If you sweat more, you might need more sodium. Magnesium, I usually recommend that people supplement with, especially in the beginning, although I've been doing keto for five years, I don't take any magnesium supplement, unless I do a lot of sauna or heavy, heavy sweating. Because magnesium can be hard to get dietarily. We've got very depleted soil in our modern culture due to degenerate farming practices, which is why nutrient density is something we always focus on, which is why my wife's book, The Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, The Training Manual for Low Carb, Ketogenic, and Paleo Cuisine, is all based around nutrient-dense, whole foods-based recipes. That's why we include a whole section on nutrient-dense organ meats, which are the most prized pieces of the animal in nature that are often neglected in modern in modern diets. In fact, a lot of these organ meats can be way cheaper than steak and muscle meat. So including foods like heart and liver, which we've got recipes for in the book and recipes for on our website, primaledgehealth.com. Check out my wife's book if you're looking to uh, kind of expand your knowledge of ketogenic food prep. Making a solid foundation of being able to prepare your own food is crucial when you're starting keto. And she put together one of the best resources available out there for whole foods, nutrient dense, ketogenic, low carb, and paleo style cuisine. So, nutrient density important, electrolytes, magnesium, back to the magnesium. I usually recommend people supplement with magnesium. I start with about 400 milligrams, sometimes go double that, like 800 milligrams, sometimes per day. Magnesium glycinate, citrate, or malate are usually some of the more bioavailable sources that aren't going to cause digestive disturbances. Don't do magnesium oxide. It'll send you run into the bathroom. You're going to have disaster pants and you're not going to have a good time. Um, potassium is the last micronutrient that we're going to talk about now. The last electrolyte. Potassium you can get from food. You can get from avocado, spinach, mushrooms, leafy green vegetables, even meat, eggs, and seafood have a significant amount of potassium. But if you want to supplement with that, some people do well supplementing with it in the beginning using like light salt or no salt, which is just potassium chloride or potassium citrate. You want to get in at least 1.5 to 3 grams of potassium per day, which you can get through diet eating foods like avocado, spinach, leafy greens, meats, fish, and seafood. And you can get, uh, you can get magnesium from foods like chocolate, 100% cacao which we've actually got some Ecuadorian cacao, organic heirloom Ecuadorian cacao on our website as well. Um, so there you go. The macros are the first priority. Getting those electrolytes in second, and then just forming a solid foundation of nutrient-dense foods that you can eat consistently is very, very important. So starting by getting like three or four breakfasts that you can rotate in, that you enjoy. You don't have to make this a culinary excursion every single time you're preparing foods, but having some good meal prep ideas and having a planned out week of food and just finding certain staples that you can eat all the time. I know I can always eat steak or eggs. I love having some liver. We'll make liver in bulk and have it in the fridge. I'll have a few bites of liver and some steak for breakfast. And for me, that's good. I don't do well with a lot of fiber. So I do a mostly carnivorous style keto ketogenic diet. I found that after five years of a keto diet, that's how I prefer eating. So you don't need loads of vegetables on keto. You don't need vegetables at all to maintain health. And a lot of people with gut dysbiosis issues do better without those fibrous, abrasive vegetables and the anti-nutrients in them, the phytates that come in those foods, as well as the lectins that can aggravate the gut. So a ketogenic diet, really easy to implement if you get the basics right. Get your macros in line, get sufficient protein. Fat is your energy source. That can come from the plate or for your, from your body. Get enough electrolytes in. Focus on nutrient-dense, unrefined whole foods. Get adapted to the diet. The first few weeks are the most difficult. It takes time to generate the mitochondria to actually burn the fatty acids and to use those ketones. And sometimes in the beginning, our guts have to get used to digesting different foods. Our liver, pancreas, gallbladder have to create different enzymes to digest the fats from the diet or from the body. And some people can get the keto flu in the beginning. Don't worry, it passes. Sometimes a lot of the bacteria you've been feeding, the candida, H. pylori, the yeast, the fungus, have to leave the body. And sometimes they revolt on the way out. They release some toxins and you'll get some flush into the digestive system in those first week or so. But the body does adapt. And once you start getting adapted to the diet, you will feel it. And hopefully, it doesn't take too long. 
So if you get your cards in line, you get your macros and your micronutrients right, you're gonna do just fine on a ketogenic diet. It's not as difficult as they make you think. It's not some esoteric difficult state that must be measured constantly through blood ketone strips. You don't ever have to measure your blood ketones if you don't want to. I don't recommend obsessively measuring blood ketones ever. In fact, I've had many clients come to me who've been obsessing over their blood ketone levels. As soon as we stopped measuring and started focusing on dialing in the diet, getting in those nutrient dense foods, solid meal prep strategies, they get the results they wanted, the stress leaves, because they're not worrying about the wrong thing. So we get a lot of clients coming to us for private coaching. Next month, we're gonna be decreasing the amount of private clients we take on because we're doing the Keto Collective Community Coaching setup, which is so much more fun. We do it on a live Discord server, do several live interactive voice chats per week. We teach heavily from the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, meal prep strategies, optimizing the circadian rhythm, getting proper meal timing, Right, a lot of people come, especially a lot of ladies, start doing intermittent fasting in the beginning, which can be an issue for hunger and satiety levels throughout the day. So if you're starting out keto, I don't recommend starting with intermittent fasting. Playing with meal timing later on, making sure to get breakfast can be very, very important. The next Keto Collective session actually starts two weeks from now. We're going to max it out at 50 participants this time. Probably get about 40. We usually get about 40 participants in it, and it's always really, really fun. We get a lot of coaches, in fact, that come to the Keto Collective to use and learn how to implement a ketogenic diet for their clients because it is a powerful tool for fat loss that a lot of people have underutilized. It could be one of the easiest ways to lose body fat, simply getting somebody on a low carbohydrate diet, adapting them to that state, and letting them burn that body fat long term. So if you want to hit us up for the Keto Collective, there's a link down below in the description. It starts in two weeks. We do it every other month, and we max it out at 50 participants per month. We use live Discord, live voice chats, two times minimum per week, and it's a community-based setting, and you don't have to make it to every live chat because we record them, and you have all the resources, including our meal prep packet, available for you forever, as long as the internet exists. And that starts in just two weeks, and we do it every other month, in case you're watching this later on. So ketosis, not difficult to attain, not important to be measuring constantly. You could burn fat from your plate or from the body, get sufficient protein, keep those carbs low, get the electrolytes right, get those meal prep strategies dialed in, find meals that you can eat that are made from whole, unrefined foods, protein doesn't come in a powder, protein doesn't come from peas, protein has eyes, or a shell. <laughs> so keep it simple. Focus on the basics and build your foundation and you're gonna do fine. Get out there, go live your life.